So you all know it that life is a series of crossroads. That's actually why this church is named Crossroads because Pastor Bill and his wife Betty, when they were, they were at a crossroads in their life. God was doing a work and you know, people all the time say, why is the church called Crossroads? I'm like, well, because every day you're at a crossroads. But isn't it true that when you look back over your life, a lot of the regrets that we have about life are at moments where we're at a crossroads, you look back and you're like, I made the wrong decision, right? That's where the regrets happen, where you start to say to yourself, there was an opportunity that I either could have taken, I should have taken, I shouldn't have taken, right? I made the wrong decision. And we look back on that and we feel like ourselves like, oh man, if I could only go back and remake those decisions. Don't we all have those? You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this because so many decisions get made and so much of what our lives become are because of those decisions. Like I, and it's not only just like every decision. There's also those decisions where you know that God is inviting you into something. Right, like I think about that, like you know, as we're as we're here in the in this Christmas season right now, you know, I, I think about like Joseph who ended up getting to raise Jesus, but Jesus wasn't his biological son, and and it does that moment that when he Joseph found out that Mary was with child, he sought to put her away privately. He wanted to divorce her, and then the Lord sent an angel and talked to Joseph and said, "No, listen, she didn't do anything wrong. This is what I'm doing." At that moment, Joseph sat at a crossroads. The light is inviting him to, to be a part of the story of God coming to earth. But Joseph had to make a choice. You think about Moses. When Moses was spending, he had, he had been in the desert for 40 years, right? He's, he's tending to his, father, his father-in-law's sheep, and all of a sudden, he notices this tree, this bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And at that moment, he could have either Oh man, whatever, man. I've just been out in the desert too long. I gotta keep walking. I need to find me some water. I gotta get home. You know, I'm gonna miss the game, whatever, you know, whatever. But at that moment, the light invited him and he stopped. And so much of what went on in his life is because of what do we do when there's that little flicker of light that says, Will you, will you come this way? You know, I was just thinking about this as I was preparing it in my own life. I remember. The very first time I ever fasted, I, I mean, it was such a strange, I met, when, as an all-Italian kid from New Jersey, when I was reading in my Bible, talking about people not eating, I remember, I'm like, what's this fasting thing? My pastor's like, oh, it's when you choose not to eat. I'm like, why would anyone ever choose not to eat? You know, like, it, it, like, it just made no sense to me. He's like, oh, well, listen, he's like, everyone likes to eat. And I'm like, no, I really like to eat, you know? And, and, and so like, no, but you want to set yourself apart. You're saying, God, I need you more than what I need, which is food, right? So I remember the very first time, I'm like, I'm going to fast. And I remember how hard it was, but I remember in the midst of that, I was pursuing a career in music, and that was when God called me into ministry. But I remember at that point, it was like my music career was taking off, and the band I was playing with had a booking, and everything was going to happen, and then the light saying, hey, psst, come on, right? And I remember at that point how hard it was, because I was in a band with some of my closest friends, and what was that going to mean? But again, I'm so super grateful that God said, I want you to go this, and I was willing to go. Right? Or even coming up here to Crossroads. I remember when Pastor Bill and I started talking about Crossroads, my first thought was, there ain't no way. Like, who wants to be the guy who come after Bill Ritchie? That's dumb, you know? It's like, like no, they're gonna hate that guy. I had a friend be like, don't go. They're gonna hate you there in Crossroads, you know? It's like, they're gonna hate your guts. Good encouraging friend. He was just pragmatic. He was being real. But I remember in that moment, there's a Crossroads. Like, what are you gonna do? And I'm so grateful that the light said, come on, I want to do something. I was willing to say yes. Now, I shared two examples of when I said yes. So how many times did I say no, though? All right, how many times for each one of us, you see the light in the horizon and God saying, hey, I want to do something. And we're like, oh, Lord, no thanks. I'm busy. I don't think that that's your plan. That sounds scary. And so much of life boils down to when Jesus invites us, are we willing to say yes? Are we willing to simply respond to Jesus? And that's not only true in the big life decisions, but it actually, the way that God grows us up in our faith, the way that we grow in Christ, actually boils down to in a million and one little situations Are we gonna do what we've always done or are we gonna chase the light 
and move in different directions. And I wanna explore that with you today. So I want you to open up in your Bibles, 1 John chapter one. We're gonna take verses five to nine. So John's first epistle. So uh, if you're new to the Bible, um, it's easy to find 1 John because if you go to the back of your Bible, right, like you turn the Bible over so you're at the end and, and you start moving to the left, you have the book of Revelation and then a very small book called uh, the book of Jude and then you have John's three letters, 3 John, 2 John, and 1 John. If you're coming from the back, if you're going from the beginning, it's 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, but we're doing it in reverse, right? So 1 John, and we're gonna be taking chapter one, a message that I'm calling the light embrace. You know, as you're turning there, or if you're watching, looking in on your phone or wherever, you know, I, I experienced this this morning, this willingness to, to follow the light because as I was coming to church, I normally leave to come on Sunday mornings before my kids are awake. And it was so funny because I walked into the, I was leaving and I was going to the garage to go to the car and all of a sudden I heard this ruckus and as I was leaving the house, I was having one of those moments like, oh man, Oh, like, I hope this goes okay this morning. You know, like, it's kind of in your head about what you have to do. And all of a sudden, I heard this commotion, and I turned around, and sure enough, my, my five-year-old Annabelle comes barreling through the door, right? And she came through so fast that we both got freaked out by each other. It's because it's like, like, she, like, almost runs into me, and <gasps> we're both scared, and she's like, Dad, I just want to tell you that you're awesome, and I love you. And she gave me a big old hug, you know? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I scared you. She's like, that was scary, you know? And then she just ran away. But I thought to myself, you know, like, in that moment, out of all the things that Annabelle could do coming down the stairs, she heard me leaving and she ran after me just to tell me that she thought I was awesome. And I thought to myself, I'm like, that's awesome that she did that. She didn't have to. She'd be like, oh, I don't want to go bother dad or I don't want to have to run in the garage. But sometimes that crossroads of life is something as simple as that, where God's like, I want you to go encourage that person. I want you to go tell somebody who you're with all the time, how awesome you think they are, that you love them. So much of chasing the light is about things just like that. Now, listen to what the Apostle John says. If we pick up, I actually wanna pick up in verse four. So it says this, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And if we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. For if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you notice he says, we write these things that your joy may be full, right? So, so the reason John wrote this letter is that the people of God may have fullness of joy. And he says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you. He's like, John's like, this is the message that Jesus told us and we want to tell you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. Now, that, that seems so trivial, and if you've been, you know, part of this chase of the light, this isn't the first time that's been said. But it does bear to be repeated over and over and over again that God is light, and it says that God is light, and in God there's no darkness at all. So the idea of God being light what it means is that in the very person or the very nature of God, there is nothing that would pertain to darkness. And, and in this sense, it means anything that is evil, anything that is impure, anything that is unholy. So the light-darkness paradigm is being used here to speak about God and God's perfections. Now, the reason we need to repeat it, of course, is because sometimes life wants to tell you that God is, has some darkness within him. That sometimes your circumstances, or we live in a culture that says, this is why God, if God is real, God is not good. And I'm here to tell you, the word of God tells us that God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. Now, at that point, you either trust the word of God or you trust the way you choose to interpret the events of your life. 
Like, if you think about the worst possible things that go on in the world, mo a lot of people, not most people, but a lot of people interpret those events to say, there is darkness in God. If there is a God, God is not good. And many of us have had that thought, haven't we? But when we, just because we have those thoughts, our job in life is not to believe everything that you think. Our job in life is to take the things that we think and weigh them against the word of God. And the word of God says that God is pure light. God is good all the time. There is no darkness in God at all. You notice those two words? There's no darkness at all. And what that means for us then is that in looking at the situations that you find yourself in and in looking at the circumstances of the world in which we live in, that we always have to keep in mind that no matter what the circumstances are, God is light. And there is no darkness in God. God's ways are always perfect, especially when they don't make any sense to us. Jesus said it this way, speaking about God being light. John chapter eight, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. How powerful is that? God who is light and in him is no darkness at all. That God came and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. And that's what Christmas is all about, isn't it? It's the God who is light coming to inhabit a world that is full of darkness. See, one of the most, when you think about the coming of Jesus, obviously we realize that Jesus is, as, a, as the church, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, God coming and dwelling in the midst of a humanity that he created and who, that he sustains every day. And then ultimately we celebrate the the resurrection season, the crucifixion of Jesus and then his resurrection, which is the climactic moments in the life of Jesus. And when you think about Jesus on the cross, was there ever a time when you would think to yourself, man, darkness has won out? When the Son of God is crucified, the only perfect person, the only person who never did anything wrong is being crucified as a seditious traitor by the Roman Empire. You think, oh man, darkness won out. No. It's God's greatest triumph, isn't it? What would your life look like if no matter what you've gone through, no matter what is on the horizon for you, you say to yourself, because God is light and in him there's no darkness, even though I don't enjoy this, my God who is light is gonna bring light through it. Doesn't that change everything? In a lot of ways, that begins a journey. Because I, like, I say that, and then there's that part of me that's like, well, do I really believe that? Like, like, can I really look at my life through the lens of the word of God that tells me that there's no darkness in God? That at every moment when I think that maybe God doesn't have a good plan, I'm just flat out wrong. That God can leverage the worst possible situations because he's light and there's no darkness in him. That God's plans are good even when they make absolutely no sense. See, that's what's called walking by faith. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And I think what God wants us to learn how to do is to trust him because he's light. How different would you frame different times in your life? How different would you see circumstances if we trusted that Jesus is the light of the world? Now, what's powerful for us, though, is that because God is light and because Jesus came as the light of the world, what does it mean for us? Now, look at what it says here in verse 6. It says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, 
We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Brothers and sisters, because God is light, you and I, we need to walk in light. Because God is light, now we're invited to walk in light. And because if you believe in Jesus, if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you know Jesus has the light of the world. And then it says, and if you believe in Jesus, then it says if we have fellowship with him. See, that's what God offers. See, Jesus in the incarnation, this idea of God being with us offers the opportunity to have fellowship with God, to have a relationship with God. Now, it doesn't just say a friendship with God. It says that in other places in the scriptures. But this idea of fellowship with God, that word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, which which really literally means to hold things in common. That's what it means. And so when a person believes in God who is light, he invites us into koinonia, to, ha- to hold things in common with him. And it would make total sense that if God is light and in him is no darkness at all, that if, if we have fellowship with him, then we can't walk in darkness because we are in the light. Remember, and I've said this before, that when there is darkness, the light doesn't ask permission to disperse the darkness the light just gets turned on, right? And the darkness can't, they can't coexist together. And so what happens for each one of us is that because Jesus is light and because we trust him, then we get to have fellowship with him. And when that happens, then of course, we can't walk in darkness because we're in fellowship with the light. So what happens for us is that we begin to walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, things begin to change for us. And, and this is a powerful reality, I think. And it's something that I think that we need to spend more time reflecting on because when somebody puts their faith and trust in Jesus for the very first time, the Bible calls that being justified, right? Where you go from being not guilty to being forgiven, right? And so you go from being guilty, you, 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 you've failed in a million ways, and because of your faith and trust in Jesus, God declares you not guilty because you trust in Jesus, Right? So that's called being justified. But then once a person is justified, now you're in fellowship with God and you begin to walk in the light, right? Now, once we begin to walk in the light, God begins to purify our lives in experience. So if somebody gets, when someone gets saved, if you were to die, you would go and be with God in heaven. But when somebody gets saved and then they begin the journey of walking with Jesus, they get to choose to walk in the light. But here's the thing. At the moment someone puts their faith and trust in Jesus, there's all sorts of things in our lives that are broken. Can we all just admit that? There's just broken things about our lives, right? Like sometimes it's just straight up, we have habits, they're all jacked up, right? And for many of us, we don't even realize how jacked up those habits are until we get saved, right? Like I was in that camp. I did all these things that I didn't think were wrong because no one told me that they were wrong and everybody around me was doing them and it was even kind of legal in some ways. You know, now this, a lot of that stuff's legal, which is crazy, but, but you know, it's like everybody was doing it so you didn't even think about it, but then all of a sudden you get saved and then you're like, whoa, I'm messed up, right? And you're talking to your friends who aren't saved and you're like, bro, this is kind of messed up and they're like, this isn't messed up, you're messed up. Like, no, no, no. We've been messed up for a long time. I'm just aware of it. Because now all of a sudden, in the context of the light, as you have fellowship with a God who has no darkness in him, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, right? So by walking in the light, the darkness begins to be exposed as darkness. And at that point, some of it's habits. Some of it's just the way that we think. I mean, I always like to laugh and it makes me cry when I think about it sometimes, is that if, if, if there was like a running, like a ticker tape, like the stock market, of all the thoughts I have on a given day, if anybody saw that, they'd be like, man, Fusco is a freak show. <laughs> because the number of, th- like these thoughts pass through your mind that, you know, and you just have these, like, it's like these, your, your brain is having these thoughts. And the only thing that gives me any comfort is I know that if I saw the ticker tape of your thoughts, I'd think you're a freak show too. You know what I mean? So it's like, like we're all in this together where you, like, we have all these thoughts. And what happens is, is when, you, when you get saved and you begin to walk with the Lord and as God begins to share with you the mind of Christ, you begin to realize like, man, my thinking is broken. Like when you're like, I can't believe I actually think that. 
And that thinking drives the way we make decisions, the way we treat people, all these different things. And so you start to realize that your, your thoughts are broken, right? And then you begin to realize how much the, the ways that you were raised, no matter how awesome or not awesome your family was, you're like, man, I was socialized to think all sorts of crazy stuff, right? And, and so, but as you're walking in fellowship with the Lord, you begin to realize that you don't, that you're not walking in light. But then the choice becomes, will you let God lead you into light or will you retain those areas of darkness in our life? And I think maturity in Christ comes on these levels, right? Like, will, as God is inviting us into the light, will you simply respond? Will, will you say, you know, Lord, I don't want to do that anymore because I think you're asking me not to or your word tells me not to. Like, I remember what it was like when I started walking with Jesus and there was all these things that, things that I had done forever that I started to say, I, I don't think I want to do this anymore and, and how challenging that was. Some of you are in that right now where it's like you're trying to build new ways of living because you want to walk in the light and it's really hard. And I just want to tell you, it's hard. Like, it's not easy. But what I will tell you is that as you fellowship with the Lord and you begin to walk in the light, it gets easier over time. It's, it's kind of like if you live in a certain climate, you're, you're climatized to living in that climate. Like I remember growing up in New Jersey, super hot, humid summers and freezing cold winters were normal. And now, because I live in the Northwest, I'm just a wimp. You know what I mean? Like, 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 like I, was, I was just telling someone earlier, my family's like, when are you gonna come visit? I'm like, I never come in winter and I never come in summer. Because I don't wanna be in hot, humid weather and I don't wanna be in freezing cold weather. And I'm like, but I grew up in this. But you get climatized, don't you? Like, it becomes normal. Like, for it's raining out here. Like, it's not raining. It's just winter, right? Someone else, they show up from California. They're like, oh my gosh, it's so moist here. Right? Because you get, you, you get used to the climate. And in the same way, when you're walking in darkness, you become acclimated to dark walking. And then once you leave the darkness and you begin to walk in the light, you become acclimated to walking in the light. For many of us, it's, you know what it's like to look back on a past that was so messed up that you feel like a different person. You're like, I don't know that person. Like, I remember that person, but it's me, but it's like a whole other life. Because you become acclimated now to walking in the light. But what's amazing is, is that when you walk in the light, notice what it says. I think this is really beautiful. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. It began with fellowship with God who is light. But then when we walk in light, then we get to have true fellowship with one another. And really what this means is that the, the people of God, the church, the fellowship that we have, it's not like any other set of relationships. Because this is a relationship that was born in the light, God's light that he shares with us. And then as we walk in the light together, we get to share fellowship with one another. So sometimes we say, man, the church is good for community. It is, but it's a community unlike any other community because it's a community that's born in the light. Now, I want you to take a moment, just look around the sanctuary for a second. Go ahead, look around. For those of you who are joining us online, I want you to just look at your screen. But just imagine all the different people who are, who, who are, who are around there. This is not like any other community. Because, like, you, you can go to a sporting event, and there's people from all different age places and, and, and different styles and all the things. But this is not like a sport. This is a community that is born in light. Like, we get to have fellowship with one another because God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And we begin to walk in the light. And as we walk in the light, now all of a sudden we have fellowship with one another. We get to truly know one another. And it doesn't matter how you vote. and It doesn't matter what your history is. It doesn't matter what you failed at or how long your rap sheet is or if you were the most moral person next to Jesus himself who ever lived because of God's light and we're in fellowship with God. Now all we're in fellowship with one another and we get to love one another even in the midst of our differences. But what's amazing is, is that 
what I'm always learning is that where when darkness begins to creep in, it starts to pull fellowship apart, right? And the thing is, is it's, there's all of us, we can, if we're not careful, our own darkness begins to break fellowship. It can happen in friendships, it can happen in marriage, it can happen in families, it can happen on the job, where before you know, we start harboring resentments or hurts. We begin putting suspicion in the gap when we don't understand what someone's doing or why. And before you know it, we start walking in darkness a little bit and things start to come apart. But when we walk in the light as he is in the light, not only do you get that fellowship with one another, it says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Wow. I want you to notice the verb in that. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, what, what does it do? Cleanses. Does it say cleansed in the past? No. It says it's in the present tense. He's cleansing us now. Now, what does, it doesn't mean that Jesus' salvation is progressive and it takes, but what it's saying is that the, the application of the purification that happens to us when the blood of Jesus Christ is applied to our life happens as we walk in community together. We get to experience it together. Like, and that's the beauty of the people of God. That's the beauty of what Christmas is about because as you walk in fellowship with one another because of your fellowship with God who is the light, you begin to see people change. And sometimes the application in experience of the finished work of Jesus happens 20 years in the journey following Jesus. That's so why, what do I always say here? We're all in what? Process. But that process comes with fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. And then all of a sudden you see people change. And that's why God wants us to, to hope with one another and to walk with one another through the, the messy times and the good times. Instead of just what happens is something gets messy, we have a tendency to want to break things apart. But the God's like, no, 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 listen, maybe this is the time, this part of the character of God, God's gonna put on display in our hearts. Can we hang in there long enough? Can there be enough friction so that it happens? But, but here's the thing. The church is a group of people who Jesus has cleansed by his own blood. And this, we never want to miss this. The idea of the blood of Jesus, it speaks of his death. Right? Jesus' death, the, the shedding of his blood. Sometimes people, like, they get really kind of ritualistic about it. We're like, oh, like, we need to talk about the blood of Jesus. The blood. It speaks about his death, right? And when somebody believes in Jesus, you're believing that God sent Jesus to die in your place. And when a person exercises faith, the blood of Jesus now gets applied to our life. Jesus' death stands in the place where my death deserved. I deserved it. My mistakes were punishable by death. And we trust in Jesus. That's how a person is saved. You're not saved by getting better. You're not saved by stopping using drugs. You're not saved by finally forgiving that person who wronged you. You're saved by the death of Jesus in your place. And I believe that there might be some of you, you're here today in our sanctuary, some of you may be joining us online, you've never received God's forgiveness in Christ. And I, I, I want you to be cleansed because God sent Jesus to cleanse. Sent Jesus to cleanse. The Apostle Paul said it this way, Ephesians chapter five, verse eight to 11. For you were once darkness. You hear that? You were once darkness. He's like, so you used to be in darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. See, see, what, see what Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus? He's saying, look, you used to be in darkness, but now you're in light. So walk as children of light. And, and then he, as he's talking about this idea of light, he said, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, which is who Jesus is. And then it says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. See, and this talks about how we walk every day. 
Because we used to be darkness and now we're light, now our job is to find out, God, what's acceptable to you? And in any area of our life where we're not walking in what's acceptable to God, then we take that step. We have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness anymore. The things that we used to do. And that's what's called a testimony, isn't it? A testimony is the things that you used to do until you knew better because you put your faith and trust in Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, you know you're growing in Christ when you have a testimony. And a testimony is not how nasty you used to be and we embellish how nasty we are and we sit and tell war stories. Well, I did this and I did this. That's not a testimony. That's just us getting in the flesh, thinking back. The testimony is, I used to do all that stuff, but I learned in a more better way, a more excellent way. I took the next set of steps. But when we walk in the light, that's what happens. So if you're saying to yourself, okay, so if God is light, I want to walk in the light, how do I do it? Listen to what it says, verse eight. For if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you want a simple encouragement this Christmas season? Get honest and get cleansed. You gotta get honest. Look at what it says. I, and, I, and This is why I love the Bible so much because this is, we're encouraged to do something that is so uncomfortable. Look at what it says. It says, if we have no sin, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if you're here and you say, well, I got no sin. What does it say? You deceit, you're self-deceived and you don't know the truth. Ouch. Right? So is anyone here want to say that they have no sin? Anybody? Bueller. Bueller. Anybody want to take that one? I'm so proud of you guys. You guys, you guys are trusting the word of God. Because if it says if you have no sin, you're deceived and the truth is not in you. So we don't want to walk in that. So then what should you do? Verse 9. If we confess our sins. Brothers, that's getting honest. Confessing our sins is simply agreeing with God. He's light. There's no darkness at all in him. We want to walk in the light. But guess what? As we walk in light, we realize there are several species of darkness that's going on in our hearts. We got all sorts of stuff going on in there, right? And so we're not going to make the mistake of saying we have no sin because the truth is in us. So what do we do? We confess our sins. We get honest. And confessing that word confession in the Greek, it literally means to say the same thing that God says. So I want to free you up from feeling that you have to perform in the name of Jesus. You're allowed, because you're in fellowship with God and the light, and because you're in fellowship with other people, it's okay to say, I totally am screwing this thing up. And nobody should be shocked about that. Because all of us have sin, and all of us are seeking to walk in the light. And what God asks us to do is to get radically honest about it. Do you ever notice when someone calls you on your stuff, we start doing the don't judge me dance? Who do you think you are to judge me, right? This happens every time something happens. I'm like, who, why are you judging me? I'm not. Every time I feel like someone's judging me, I'm like, oh, this is me not wanting to confess my sins. I'm trying to find a way to deflect it. Deflect it. I don't want to look at it. No, get honest. Listen, you're a sinner. Go look at the person next and say, sinner. Go ahead. Look at the other person and say, you wretch. Go ahead, tell them. All the married couples are like, yeah! I've been wanting to say that all week, you know? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but here's the thing. The fact that you're a sinner is just the reality that once we confess our sins, it says that God is what? Faithful, and God is what? just to do what? To forgive us our sins. And then what happens? The blood of Jesus, what? Cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So being a sinner is the entry point into salvation. When you can confess that, hey, I, I don't get it right. I confess my sins and God is faithful and he's just. Why? Because God doesn't need to condemn me for my sins because he can condemn Jesus in my place. He's faithful to us. And then he forgives me my sins. And then what happens? Then I get cleansed. So when you get honest, then you can get to be cleansed. In the same way, 
It's, it's a Sunday, right? So if, if, at the NFL, if the, if the football players are playing, the only way you get to play the game is if you're on the team, right? Even if I wanted to go out and play, and my New York Giants definitely need me right about now, <laughs> right? It's like, they, I'm not on the team. Listen, the only way to be forgiven is to be able to admit that you need forgiveness. And so often people struggle with that. But there's nothing that's more beautiful than when someone, when the light is calling someone and they begin to realize, I don't know that I can take that step because I got all this darkness in my life. That is the best place to be because now someone is being aware of the fact that God is saying, you're not getting it all right. You're not getting it all done. You're not perfect. And then you come and you say, oh God, I'm not getting it all done. And God says, I know. But once you ask for forgiveness, I'm faithful to God. I'll forgive you. And then I'll cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But you need to get honest so that you can get cleansed. And you know what I love so much about what Jesus does once he cleanses a person? Just as he's light, he calls us light. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. Jesus told his disciples, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and they put it under a basket or put on a lampstand that it can give life to all who are in the house. And he says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When somebody gets honest and confesses and then they get cleansed, then he's like, guess what? Just as I'm the light of the world, now you're the light of the world. And I love it. He says, the city set on a hill but cannot be hidden. If you go to the north end of the Sea of Galilee in a place called Capernaum, Right? right where the Sermon on the Mount was given, where I just read that. If you were to turn around and look behind you, there's a huge hill and there's a city on the hill. It's called the city of Safad. It was there in the time of Jesus. And what's really powerful is I just imagine that moment. Jesus says, you're the light of the world. And he turned around and he pointed at the city of Safad on that hill and said, see that city? Can't be hidden. Those who have gotten real, gotten honest, and gotten cleansed, you can't hide those people. God doesn't want to take a light, put it in a basket. He puts it on a lampstand that the whole house may have light. And I'm here to tell you that when you get honest and you're okay to say, like, I'm not perfect, you're not, no one's going to be shocked by that, right? You agree with God, God cleanses. Now, all of a sudden, now God plugs you in to his heart and you become a light source. Not one that's hidden, but one that's on display for everyone to see. And when I think about the Christmas season, I realize that the light invites all of us. But those who respond to the light's invitations, chooses to walk in the light, God blesses you with fellowship with God and with other people. He does a work. And in the safety of God being the light who forgives, we get to be real honest about who we are. We get to say, listen, I'm so sorry, I've totally mangled this area of my life, or I got this thing wrong, or I wish I could go back and redo this, or I'm really having a tough go at life right now. I'm making all these mistakes, and you know? And when you do that, there's no judgment in the body of Christ because when we confess our sins, we're reminded that confessing our sins is the prerequisite to receiving salvation. And when that happens, the finished work of Jesus cleanses us. Brothers and sisters, God wants the people of God to light up this world like the water covers the sea. He wants you not to be a city that's hidden, not a lamp that's in a closet. He wants to set you up on a lampstand that the whole world might see the light of humble grace in your life. And when that happens, his light shining through us will be so substantial that they'll see the way that we live, which is different, and they'll give God glory. Isn't that the testimony we want of the people of God in this generation? Amen. Let's be those people. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we pray together.